head start on the night. Uh, we'll start with some, some prayer requests, um, some things that are maybe kind of new to, to this, uh, this list. Uh, Faye Gamble's brother, Horace Duggar, uh, was recently diagnosed with uh, lung cancer, and he's going to be undergoing some tests on Monday, but hopefully it'll give them more information about how to, to address that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. A uh, couple of things with uh, uh, Pato, Patricio, Sotomayor, two sisters in Ecuador uh, dealing with two different issues. One of his sisters, Carla, um, had to have a tumor removed from her uterus. Apparently they were able to, to save her uterus, but had to remove a tumor, and so she's recovering from that. And his other sister, Claudia, uh, has been diagnosed with lupus. So I'm sure that's tough on Pato being here while they're there, um, but... I want to continue to remember, remember that. And a former member, Ashley Bales, uh, her mother, Beth Young, is in ICU at Vanderbilt in Nashville with a, a ruptured uh, brain aneurysm. And that's all I've, I've, I've got here. Do not know anything more about that. Wanted to update you on um, a couple of situations we've been concerned about. Uh, the Osborne's uh, daughter-in-law, uh, Eva Prather, uh, still missing uh, as far as I, I know. I just checked a few minutes ago to see if there had been anything posted on uh, anything in um, like the Missoula papers and stuff like that, news outlets. Uh, still, still nothing and really hasn't been any new information for uh, a few days. So just want to continue uh, praying for them. Um, and Brad and Suzanne will be doing some traveling back and forth uh, as some family members um, kind of play tag team, staying with the, the, the family there. And then uh, regarding Grady King, um, did not have a chance to check through the day, but I know uh, last night uh, when I checked, there was um, still, you know, basically no update. Still remains stable but critical. Um, so I want to continue to remember that situation. So... Uh, probably heard on, uh, on Sunday about uh, Wes and Fran and the, the birth of, of their new daughter, Skye, uh, and so want to uh, rejoice with them on that. So, anybody got anything you want to add to our list? Got some other people on here that I'll mention as we pray that, that are ongoing thoughts, but anything else you might have? We'll also remember our, uh, our teen group as they head, uh, it's just, you know, it's really tough, uh, but they're headed to the beach, oh. you know, I know it is, it's tough, it's just some people, some people are willing to take one for the team, you know, and I appreciate that, but yeah, that's the thing, want to kind of remember that, because, you know, of course the reality is, um, if it is predicted to be uh, bad weather over Sunday, Monday. Uh, first of all, um, I've found that most of those predictions uh, are only as good as if it's like for the next minute. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, for all we know, we'll be wearing shorts and running around 75 degree weather on Monday. I doubt it, but you know, we'll, uh, we'll certainly see. Uh, but want to remember that. For 75 degrees, yeah, well, I know. Yeah. what the weather really is. Just what, Just the, what the forecast is. Works for me. Uh, so, obviously, we'll remember that. Kroger pays them to do it. So. Kroger pays them, yeah. I'm sure that's where everybody is tonight, is they're probably in line getting their bread and milk because, you know, it, 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 you know. <clears throat> I was telling someone, um, you know, being kind of from north-ish, but a place that regularly got snow. I was just uh, overwhelmed with uh, culture shock when I was in school uh, all those many years ago, work nights at, at FedEx, and on my way home they had predicted like some, you know, ice or snow for the next 24 hours or whatever, and I thought, well, I'll just swing in this 24-hour Kroger. Remember when stores stayed open 24 hours? And I swung into a 24-hour Kroger, and it was it was me and all the blue hairs in there at like three in the morning, you know, getting, 
you know, they had already ransacked the bread and milk sections. And then there were, I just remember this one guy with his cart was just like a mountain of canned goods. I thought, you know, maybe he thought he was going to be like snowed or iced in for a decade. I don't know, but it was, you know, I just hope he had a can opener. Uh, but anyway, we were, I just thought, wow, this is just so unusual. And then I found out that's very usual. So. A snowplow? You were 20 before you saw a snowplow? Yeah. Had you been looking for one, or you just, you just happened you to... Never, need never needed one, yeah. yeah. That's, that's how uh, I'm told how people from Minnesota know where to retire to, is they buy a truck, put a snowplow on the front, and they drive south until people go, hey, what's that? You know, so then they know that's where they should stay. All right. Oh. Got a little sidetracked. So let's pray, and then I'll give you some, some announcement information, and I will leave this sheet up here as per usual so that you can check it uh, as needed. Well, let's pray. Father God, we certainly thank you for uh, being attentive to the needs in our lives and ask you to be attentive to the needs of, of some folks that we're concerned about. Continue to be with, with John Kleiss and help there to be a path forward with his cancer treatment. We also pray for Kara's aunt uh, sandy hutchins uh, that she will be able to receive the the treatment that she needs to take uh, for the cancer that she's been diagnosed with we pray for those who are in hospice care or, or ongoing recoveries for cindy marler for faye porter for cindy ray for zeke rivers we ask you to be with with beth young that if uh, at all possible, certainly sounds serious from a layman's perspective to have a, a, a ruptured brain aneurysm, but certainly pray that that can be something that uh, there's a path forward to, to full recovery for her. We pray for Pato's two sisters and their different issues, but both of them dealing with, with uh, major medical situations and pray that you can bring about healing uh, and that also you can be with, with him as he deals with his sister's illnesses and worried about them and, and yet far, far away from them. Uh, we pray for, uh, for Faye's brother, Horace Duggar, and that the uh, test that he undergoes in the next few days will, uh, again, present a clear path forward for treatment for him. We want to continue to remember uh, the Osborne's situation with their daughter-in-law, and I, we continue to pray that there would be uh, a good ending to this, that she would be found, that she could be uh, returned to her family, and that uh, you would be with Brad and Suzanne as they seek to minister to their family, that you'd give them strength as they do that. And we pray for, for Grady, and that you would, uh, uh, again, just be present for him, for his family, that you would bring about healing. Uh, Father, we also want to, uh, to lift up our uh, team group as they uh, head out on a, a trip on Friday. Uh, safe travels, uh, please grant to them. Uh, and on top of that, just to make the weather clear enough for their safe return on schedule. And again, we want to just rejoice with Wes and Fran uh, and ask that you would bless them uh, as they move forward. Uh, with now an expanded family, and that you would bless those relationships to grow, and for, uh, for Sky to grow to be someone who represents you well in this world. Thank you for being good to us. Help us, Father, to be people who represent you well, that our words and our actions will be such that, uh, just like what happened with some of the apostles in the book of Acts, that folks will, will say, you know, those people have been with Jesus, and that's really what we want. It's through Christ we pray, amen. So in terms of announcements, Ladies Fellowship Day, stop by when you can. Uh, Saturday, January 13th, 12 p.m. to 6 p.m., stopping for prayer time at 2 p.m. Is that still correct? It's going to be at Don's uh, house, so uh, if you are, are interested, bring some snacks and games to share fun time together. Uh, Fellowship Potluck Sunday right after second service, so please make sure you are aware of that. Invite others, be there, uh, bring, uh, you know, I think this is uh, kind of thing where you just, you, you bring a little extra and uh, then bring someone else with you. So that's Sunday after second service. 
The 39ers meet for breakfast at Wally Hatchets on Tuesday, January 23rd. That's 9 a.m. There's a list to sign up in the foyer. Uh, it's just across the hall from Don's office. Uh, the donation pickup for Paragould Children's Home Monday, January 29th. Uh, I realize that's a way out, but uh, you know, once the stores have been emptied of these products, we'll need to go back and you know, find some more. But their requested items are bottled apple juice, almond bark, assorted spices, sugar, dishwashing detergent, and AA batteries. I'm not sure how they put all those together to make something, but you know, sounds like an interesting list of things. And you can drop off your donations in the bins that are just in the hallway headed down towards the fellowship hall. Uh, as per usual, I will leave this up here, so if you need to consult that later, uh, you're welcome to do that. Aha! So, we'll actually get started with class. Uh, if you did not get a chance to pick up one of the, uh, the cheat sheets at the back, I have a couple here. If anyone needs one, I'll be happy to pass those out, because you can't know the players without a program. Anybody? Yep. Absolutely. So they, they are at the, the, the back there. If you decide halfway through, you need another one. So we talked, we've been talking about this idea of, of the holidays, of the holy days, the days that God set aside, set apart for ancient Israel. Notice that those things had the idea of uh, trying to install in the people a rhythm in their lives in which they were remembering what God had done for them. They were able to express their gratitude that there were times just set aside for rest, which is, I think, pretty significant. Uh, that it was a chance for them to express their trust in God and a chance for them to work on their relationships with God, that vertical relationship, but then also horizontal uh, their relationships with, uh, with other folks. Uh, <clears throat> where we were last week was, you know, the idea that we have rituals too. We identified some of those, baptism, Lord's Supper, uh, giving, um, just the fact of coming together in our assemblies, uh, maybe even our Bible classes, things like, we identified things that are, are sort of rituals for us, times we set aside, and that's really all a ritual is. Ritual is not a dirty word. Uh, but the idea of here are times that we set aside to, to work on these things, to work on our relationships with God and others. So, uh, just like ancient Israel, you think, you know, first century Jewish person living at the same time as, as Jesus, but they could show up for Passover and just kind of be there, you know, just kind of be biding their time, uh, just kind of be check in the box, that people could do that then, and people can still do that now. And so the question that we asked last week was, you know, do these rituals that we go through, uh, can they become meaningless after a while? Do they become just boxes to check? And I think the conclusion we came to is absolutely, if we let them. So then our question was, how do we kind of move beyond that? How do we keep meaning infused in those rituals? And I I liked some of the stuff that we came up with uh, last week about how to keep these rituals from being dry and meaningless. You know, just you know, reminding ourselves of what the basic meaning is. You know, um, not relying on, because we certainly have some responsibility for ourselves, but you know, hoping that and, and training people too, if they, they are leading us in some of these things, to, to remind us of the meaning behind them and and just taking on ourselves that responsibility of saying you know it's it's up to me on some level to to remember what what these things are about um, and I, I thought we had some good thoughts on that last week certainly more than that and I'm just doing probably far 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 too quick a synopsis of that but we talked a little bit about keeping the rituals on track was actually an issue even in the church at first. You know, sometimes I think we get this feeling that uh, everything was both hunky and dory in the church at first. And here's the reality. It wasn't. You know, if it had been, uh, Paul probably wouldn't have had to have written all of those letters. You know, we might have gotten Philippians, but even there you've got Yodi and Syntyche not getting on, you know, when you getting along when you get to 
to, to chapter four, the reality is they had their problems too. Anytime you have people together, you lose sight of the mission after a while. You lose sight of the, the, the cause. Uh, and that, that happens, you know. I'm sure it happens in our work sometimes. Oh, no, of course not. We're, everybody's always focused and in the right direction. We talked a little bit about the Lord's Supper last week uh, and talked about how there in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul is really using some pretty harsh language, saying, I can't commend you on the way you're doing it. You're getting together and you're doing the Lord's Supper, but the way you're doing it, it's not really the Lord's Supper. Here is this ritual designed to remind you of what God has done for you in Jesus Christ and how much you owe God and, and that you have committed yourself to uh, being God's person. You are committed along with the others around you. And yet, let's test our memories here, the way they were doing the Lord's Supper, uh, how were they drawing attention to those things? Who were they trying to draw attention to ultimately? themselves. Yeah. They had turned this, this thing that's got a, a very uh, outward focus, and they've sort of said, you know, there, there may not be an I in team, but there sure is an M-E, you know. This is all about me. Uh, and, and Paul is saying that, no, you're missing it. You, you've actually turned the meaning of this ritual, you've turned the meaning of this thing that you do when you come together, you've turned it upside down. It's no longer about your relationship with God and your relationship with other people. Uh, it's about some of you showing off, uh, particularly those who were maybe well-to-do. Uh, and and to, to be honest, Paul seems to to kind of be calling some folks on the carpet. The real issue is they changed the focus. They were putting the spotlight on themselves. Uh, oh, I've died to myself. Um, and this is, this is, but it's still all about me. <laughs> like Paul's going, don't even talk to me about dying to self then. You know, you, you've totally missed it. So we talked a little bit about the Lord's Supper last week. I want us to, to shift and, and sort of move forward uh, in the same spirit. Uh, we, our, our question was, you know, do we know, uh, do we know how the early church, the church at first, did the Lord's Supper? And we talked a little bit about that. So I want to ask the same question: uh, Do we know how the church at first uh, did baptism? Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about the, you know, the the meaning of the word, you know, the the word in the and I always hate to do this because in the Greek, uh, you know, I mean, that makes you sound so. But the, the Greek word baptisma means immersion, okay? So I, I'm not talking about, uh, about that. Um, that's been a bone of contention for a lot of people in the religious world over the, the, the time. But, but the word simply means immersion, to put something under the water. Um, so, you know, we'll go ahead and... You know, it, it is it is a plunging into into water. Um, over the years, some folks have tried to to say, well, yeah, it didn't always mean that. But here's the deal: uh, one of the texts that even just recently I said, someone's just not keeping up. Uh, one of the texts in ancient um, classical Greek that was used was the. Um, is it Xenophon that wrote the Anabasis? I've slept since the last time I knew. Um, but uh, <laughs> he wrote a, a, a historical book about you know, Greek history. Actually, even, I think, uh, you know, looking back even before uh, the time of the first century, it's called the Anabasis. The going up is literally what the... Because they were going up into invading uh, against their their enemies back in the, um, the day, the, the dark side of the force from the Greek perspective, uh, the Persians, and they were going against them, and so they were invading that territory, they were going up into their territory, and at one point in there, it talks about how the army had to wade through a river, and the way Xenophon uses the, the language is they were they were baptized in the river. 
And so folks have pointed to that, and I saw someone, read of someone doing this within the last year or so, of like, see, it shows that baptism was not always about being under the water, because, you know, they were walking through this river, and therefore they were only partially submerged. But for those who, who know such things, and I'm not a reader of classical Greek, the, the Koine Greek of the New Testament is slightly different, but basically what he, he is saying there, he's almost making a joke of saying they were baptized from the waist down. Because everything from the waist down was under the water. You know, so, you know, even, even that text is still using the idea of, of baptism as, as submersion. Now, that's as technical as, as I want to get, you know, in what we're, we're doing here. But, and just to say, when I say, do we know how the early church did, the church at first did baptisms, I'm not talking about, you know, well, did they, did, was their preferred method submer, you know, submersion? Of, yes, it was. We'll get that out of the way. I'm talking about kind of the mechanics. Did they do baptisms in their assemblies? Do we know? Could have been down to the river. That's where they got the song, down to the river to pray. No. Uh, but, you know, did they do them in the assembly? You know, we talk about how, I, I know a lot of times, I've, I've heard people say things along the line of, of, you know, I just wish, you know, people would be, you know, we could see more baptisms in our assemblies. You know, that might be nice. That's great. I mean, Adrian being baptized a couple of weeks ago, that was great. That was super. Loved it. Uh, is that the only time it would count? Well, hope, not. Uh, hope, yeah. I think most of us would, would hope not because of our situations. Did they do separate from it? How did they take the, you know, we have this formalized thing that we've done in our tribe of we take your confession. Um, you know, apparently it's not, we don't consider it confessional enough for someone to say, I want to become a follower of Christ. It's like, do you believe that Jesus Christ, and sometimes we have this whole long thing, and in some churches it's very stylized, and it's like, if you don't get all the words right, you're in trouble. You know, do you believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God, so help me God, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, you know. But yeah, you know, the whole thing, you know, throw the whole creed in there. Um, do we know what they did like that in the, the first century? Do we know that? Do they even talk about that? in the New Testament anywhere. Yeah. Oh, it wasn't plural? Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got the, the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, you've got Philip, who is not even one of the apostles, but one of the, the folks that gets deaconized in uh, Acts chapter 6. But a little bit later on, he is teaching this guy who is from Ethiopia and is now teaching him. And, you know, he says, hey, here's some water. What hinders me from being baptized? Well, you know, tell you what, we can, we can take care of that. Was there a church building around? Well, we were two or more. <laughs> it's interesting, though, that, um, you know, and, and I'm just kind of, th at this point, did Philip have to stop and say to him, I, 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 before we can do that, I need to take your confession, you know, or I need to, you know, make sure that we've ticked off the box. Have you heard the word of God? Have you trusted the word of God? Do you, here, here's this guy saying, I want to be a follower of Jesus. Is that a sufficient confession? Mm -hmm. Sort of sound, yeah, I, you know. So, yeah, Tim. When I taught sixth grade in the church, <coughs> a few kids were ready to be baptized, and he talked about in the <clears throat> second chapter of, of Acts, the day of Pentecost, that what was explained in, in Peter's speech. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And 2,000 are baptized, and of 2,000 men baptized, if they said, okay, let me take your confession of each one of those, they already understood what was preached on that day. 
which is pretend to be baptized yeah. we wanted you to name the child the Son of the Holy Spirit. And they were their response was just be baptized. Right. Um, and it isn't the, the formality of the way we do it or the way someone else does it is is not what's important. Obviously what's important is the heart of those who accept Christ in the baptism. Mm. Okay, well, we can go home now, because uh, we're kind of, you know, you've just kind of moved us. Uh, it's interesting, they don't talk about any of these, the mechanics kind of stuff in the New Testament. They don't talk about it. You know, they just talk about, okay, people were, you know, you want to be, you want to become a follower of Jesus. Um, and it's interesting, on, on Acts 2, uh, there has has. Peter in his sermon even mentioned baptism. Not until they ask, what shall we do? And why do they ask, what do we need to do? Because they were convicted of sin and also convinced that. What did Peter spend most of his time talking about? You killed the Christ. That Jesus was the, Christ. the one sent from God and, oh, you know, he came, we are the visited planet, God visited us, and we killed him, you know. And so then they say, well, what, whoa, 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 what do we need to do in response to that? And, and then Peter, at that point, mentions, mentions baptism. I'm just going to say this as an aside, and this uh, and $5 will get you a $4 cup of coffee. But I also think this is, you know, may also, oh, there are no elders here. I might survive yet. No, I'm just doing, you know. Here's the reality. Uh, there are two completely different things that can go on. You can, you can preach so as to convince people of the necessity of baptism, or you can preach to teach people that Jesus Christ is Lord of the universe. And if they're convinced that Jesus Christ is Lord of the universe, then they're going to know, what, what do I need to do? To be in touch with that. And that's where baptism comes in. And I'm, I, I just, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm fully convinced. Don't, don't think I'm, I'm not. When we talk about baptism, clearly the default setting is an, an immersion in water. But here's the deal. Um, if that's an issue with someone, let's talk about it. But the primary issue that the church at first seems to be focused on is teaching people who Jesus is and what God has done in him and through him. Uh, and, and baptism is a response to that. I, I, I just wonder over the years, and I feel like I've spent part of, of my early years sometimes pretty effectively teaching people they needed to be baptized, but somehow that was disconnected from the fact that Jesus is Savior and Lord. And I'm not sure I did anybody any favors when I did that. Um, Maggie. So, John the Baptist was baptized. Mm-hmm. So, where did that come from? And, and if we hijack it for people who follow it, how, does that, how, how are those people different or connected? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and so anything that I'm about to say I would take with a large grain of salt because it did not um, anyway yeah John the Baptist baptized um, ritual bathing ritual immersions were already part of, of Second Temple Judaism uh, in fact you you find Archaeologically, you find a lot of places where they had these mikvot, uh, these these places that were just pools for uh, ritual bathing. Um, so I think it's an adaptation of that. I think what John was doing was rather than saying, "Hey, this is something that you can do just when you feel like," John was saying, "Hey, I want to turn that into a declaration of loyalty." And I think in some ways that's what. Uh, you know, Jesus calls John the Baptist a prophet, you know, speaking for, for, for God. Uh, I think, you know, Peter then on the day of Pentecost 
uh, takes that and you know we don't see behind the curtain um, there is one text where it talks about uh, baptism being associated with the ministry of Jesus but it says Jesus himself wasn't baptizing but his disciples were so I think there was already some of that cross-pollination going on as baptism as a declaration of your loyalty and, and Peter says it's that declaration of loyalty of I am in a sense, submerging myself entirely into the will of God. Uh, but says that's, that's where transition takes place. Now, like I say, someone may have a better response to that than I do. That, that's a great question. Um, that also, by the way, just fun fact to know until drop at parties, people say, well, how could they baptize 3,000 on the day of Pentecost? How could they possibly do that? Because there was more than one mikvot uh, in Jerusalem. There are a lot of different places where people could have been submerged in water. And once you're baptized, you can go baptize somebody else. That's the ultimate. It, yeah, they could, could, could do that. Um, and we, we may get to, to some of that in a little bit anyway. <clears throat> Mm, that's, a, that's a really good question, too, a really good observation um, behind that question. You know, the, the idea of Jesus is doing all of these things to say, this is how you stay close to God. And it's interesting what he says to John when he comes to be baptized by him. This is to fulfill all righteousness. Um, so, yeah, I think it does add, because if anybody could have skipped it, you know, it's like we talked about when we talk about Jesus showing up for the Passover feast and Jesus, Jesus you know, as was his custom, he showed up at the synagogue. Look, if anyone had an, if anyone had a get out of jail free card for church, it was Jesus. You know, I mean, but he didn't do that. Uh, if anybody had a get out of jail free card for, for being baptized, declaring that allegiance, then you know it would have been Jesus. And yet he says, "No, I, I need to do this." That's an, that's a good observation. Uh, you know, if if yeah, that's good. That's good. Where in Acts did they come and say we've only known the baptism of John? Mm -hmm. And they were baptized into Christ? Right. Um, Acts 18, as I recall, but I've okay. slept since then. Um, it, it's, <clears throat> I, yes, there's only one baptism, but there's only one right baptism. Um, I would venture to say that these good Jews were baptized several times before they had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And those that were on the day of Pentecost had probably been baptized with the ritual baptism of cleansing. And maybe even the baptism of John, which was unto repentance. But the baptism <coughs> that received the Holy Spirit and uh, um, forgiveness of sin was instituted there on the, on the day of Pentecost and is spoken of many other times throughout the scripture. The, the, the idea there, the, yeah, the new, the, the novum, the new thing there when uh, Peter answers that question, what do we need to do, is the idea of, of, hey, you do this, you are knitted to, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you are knitted to God's life uh, at this point. Uh, John certainly didn't speak of that the ritual bathing in, in Second Temple Judaism didn't make that connection. Um, does it get complicated? Sure, you can make anything complicated. That's why people spend entire careers in, in academia talking about these things. And that's why we're here tonight, to just get so deep that we don't know where we are. No, I want us to get out of the weeds uh, a little bit and, and think in terms of 
and, and Tim's already pointed us in that direction, they did not, seemingly did not focus on the mechanics of it in the early church. They focused on the person making the commitment. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm not doing this to exorcise any demons, um, but just to, to say, you know, I've run into things in the past of, you know, getting in trouble because in one church, because their, their, their form of baptism is not right, wrong, or indifferent. But, but to them it was right and all other ways were wrong. Was you, it, when you said the magic words, you know, took the person's confession. First of all, you cannot take it out of the baptistry. You have to take the confession in the baptistry uh, or, it's, or it doesn't count. Uh, and, and the preacher has to raise his hand, you know, and say, I now baptize you in the name of the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and if you didn't raise your hand, it didn't count. Really? You know? Yeah, there you go. You know, that's t- I, there was a there was a time when um, I was just a um, you know in my kindergarten days when I was first in in Oxford uh, that we got in trouble because a a, a a couple had come to our church uh, that. Um, they came from what was, was then, that's how old I am, a fairly new phenomenon, you know, a, a, just a completely independent community church kind of thing. And they had then moved to Oxford. They were coming from, a, as I recall, the, the Dallas, Fort Worth area. Anyway, they, they, they started attending our church. We talked to them, you know, about stuff they wanted to become members. We talked to them about the baptism that they had experienced and what they had been taught. And it mapped with, what we taught. They were baptized by immersion, you know, for the remission of sins, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, to become, you know, part of God's family. That was their understanding. They quoted the same scriptures we could quote. So we just, you know, made a decision as a leadership that, you know, we would just say, you know, Greg and Kathy are members here. You know, they've been baptized scripturally and they want to be members of this body of Christ and we recognize that. Well, we had a delegation of, of local um, ministers come to visit us. And I remember being in the office of our senior minister at the time and, and having this discussion. And one of these guys at one point literally telling us, and this was his stand, and I, I tried to give him a chance to think through it and back down, and he would not. But his stance was that the only baptisms that count, first of all, think about that for a second. The only baptisms that count, or that we know can count, are baptisms that are done by a Church of Christ preacher in a Church of Christ baptistry in a Church of Christ building. All I'm going to say is we're all in trouble, you know. And those, those others Be, were denominational baptisms. Yeah, that all others, right. Be, and, and yet the reality is, do we really mean it when we say along with the New Testament, that baptism is into Christ, not into a particular church, not into a particular congregation. That's what we've always said, but when it came down to it, it was like, no, 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 it has to be done by a Church of Christ preacher in a Church of Christ baptistry in a Church of Christ building. Well, the reason I say we're all in trouble is because even if you do your lineage back to, um, all the way back to Alexander Campbell, he was baptized by a Baptist preacher because he couldn't find anyone else who knew how to do it once he had come to being concluded, you know, the conclusion that he needed to be immersed. And it wasn't in a building, it was in a creek. A creek whose name I was supposed to have known for a restoration history class, you know, years ago, and I didn't know it then, nor do I remember it now. But anyway, so he was supposed to be baptized into, you know, he, and, and yet this, this, this guy's stance was, you know, it only counts if, if our people do it in our baptistries in our building. I'm just like, hokey smokes. That just, that doesn't map onto the New Testament uh, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so, you know, we can get caught up in, in all of this stuff. We can get caught up in the, the mechanics of it, and it strikes me that the church at first focused on who did it? 
uh, did not focus on who did it or how it was done. They were focused on the person making the commitment and, and wanted to, to honor that. I mean, you think of, of what Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 1.17. I think I have the reference on your sheet there. Uh, he even writes, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel. Now, wait a minute. Is Paul saying he doesn't care about baptism? Now, read, read Romans 6. Paul clearly thought and felt deeply committed to baptism as a ritual that we need. But he's just saying, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. When people understand what's going on in the cross, then, then that's what makes baptism important. And when people want to, to say, I am going to yield my life to the power of the cross, that's what makes baptism important. So Paul says, my first task is not just to dunk people. I mean, let me just be that blunt about it. That's not my first task. It's to proclaim Christ, and, and people respond to that. There's an interesting document, not in the New Testament, so please don't misunderstand, not saying that it is in any way, shape, or form something that we um, should follow, but I just think there are a couple of interesting things happen in a little uh, a manual called the Didache. Didache is just a Greek word meaning teaching, uh, and it apparently is, is almost something like um, a manual for, for maybe even like evangelists, little e evangelists, just people who want to, you know, how do you teach someone about stuff? And it's really interesting because there's a, a little section about a third of the way through this thing called the Didache on this is how you should baptize. Having recited all of these things, and it's talking about what's come before that, which is you know, laying out for people, there are two ways you can choose to lead your life. One is the way of, of life, in other words, in tune with God's purposes. The other is a way of death. You know, you're not in tune with God. They just laid it out. There's a way of life and a way of death. You know, you got to choose. You know, think about the names there, life, death. But go ahead and choose, you know, which one you think is, is, is where you want to be. And, and he says, okay, having recited all these things, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in running water. Or literally the Greek is living water. In other words, baptistry in a building? No, not unless you get, you know, a little, you know, action going with the, you know, jets there. You know, baptize in running water. Okay, that's, that's, that's how we want to do it. If you don't have running water, okay, okay, you might not have running water, then baptize in still water. By the way, if you baptize, I learned one time, if you baptize in running water like a creek or a river or something like that, make sure the person's nose is pointed downstream, you know. That's much to their advantage, okay. This is, you know, if you don't have running water, baptize in still water. The water should be cold, but if you don't have cold water, then use warm. You see what's happening here? Are they, are they, this, is, this is what we would prefer around here, and this apparently, uh, there's some dispute about it, but you know, maybe from, I think most people think it's from someplace probably outside of Antioch, Damascus, but in that, that area, something like that. Here's our preference, but you know, if you, can't, if you can't meet the preference then, and then it says something remarkable, which, you know, makes us kind of want to clutch our chests. <laughs> if you have neither, so neither what? Running water or still water. If you have neither, then just pour water on the head three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, that makes us clutch our chests and, and, and be... There's some indication later in the document that, okay, maybe that's just kind of a stopgap measure, okay, period of drought, or you're in the middle of nowhere, or whatever, but you know, you, you're finding some way to get this person who wants to be a follower of Christ and water together, okay? But obviously, what's the preferred method? Running water. Running water and cold. cold. Immerse, or immerse them in cold water and running water. We don't have running, but I can assure you, it is cold, you know, up there, okay, so... We've got that down pat. Now, here's, here's what I think is really fascinating. I mean, you know, we clutch our chest on the, you know, just pour water over them. Both the one who is baptized and the one who baptizes should fast beforehand. Along with any others who are able, the one that is baptized being told to fast for at least a day or two. <coughs> 
whoa, 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 whoa. I thought you were supposed to be baptized immediately upon your, your decision or whatever. And, and I, I, I see that in the New Testament, okay? So I'm, don't misunderstand. Me. Why on earth would a couple of generations down the line, uh, give or take 10 or 20 years of 100 AD, why would Christ followers be saying, you know, before someone's baptized, they, they might need to fast for a day or two. Why on earth would they say that? Okay. Built, or at least it started. It's almost like, if you will, dating and getting to know someone. I wouldn't want to marry someone and then get to know her. I would rather know her. A Bizarrely enough, enough, there's evidence that arranged marriages work better than others, but that's enough. That, that relationship. So I think there's an, an idea of, of understanding that that relationship must be Okay, I like that. And that's, you know, basically what, what you were getting at, Tim, as well. Anyone else want to throw something in here? Why on earth would they say, you know, best practice is, and, and, and they label this all the way through here. They're not saying you got to do this or you're not a Christian. They're saying, you know, our understanding is best practice or, you know, our, our kind of idea is our best practice is uh, you, you need to, to fast a day or two. Anyone else got any thoughts on that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. Absolutely. And and isn't it interesting that in even in Christian groups that practice infant baptism at a later point, they want you to go through a process that typically would be called confirmation or something like that. Because at some point, and I think it's just fascinating that here, even back then, they're going, hey, you need to fast for a couple days. Not just the person, and I, I think it's really fascinating, not just the person who is being baptized, but also the one doing the baptism. Um, clearly, they held baptism in high. You know, this is, this is a ritual you do not want to take for granted. This is not just a box to tick. And yet, clearly, the emphasis is on the people involved, not on the ritual itself. Does that make sense? Uh, and, and I know that may be a fine line, in term, but it's not just that, oh, hey, it's, you know, let's do a baptism, and isn't that cool? But it's like, hey, what is significant? What was significant a couple of weeks ago was that Adrian was baptized, not that we had a baptism. Does that make sense to us? And I think that's what sometimes we can kind of miss out on. And I know we get worried about numbers of baptisms and stuff like that. And you can even have, <clears throat> I, was, I was tangentially involved and aware of a, a church that had an, an incredible open door, bunches of baptisms, at least dozens of baptisms every year. But guess what? Year over year, their, their size as a family of God never increased. And, and it wasn't because they were out planting churches with all of these new converts. It's that not only did they have a good front door bringing people in and convincing people to be baptized, but the back door was wide open too. So we got a lot of baptisms, but there were not a lot of relationships cemented from that. Because again, I, and, and I don't, I'm not trying to be mean-spirited, I'm just trying to point out, 
you can become so focused on the ritual you forget what the ritual is for. And, and it is to, in this case, at least one of the things that happens in, in baptism is that it's about this relationship that's established. And clearly to me, the, the first, the church at first had their, their focus on that. We could talk a little bit about Bible study. Uh, typically, how do we do Bible study in, individually? We've shifted gears a little bit, but how do we do Bible study individually? Anybody in here got a Bible? Anybody in here read their Bible? We, gonna, we do our Bible study. Not going to ask for show of hands, be embarrassing. No, I'm just joking. But we've got our Bibles. We've got our Bibles on our apps. We've got all of these, these, these things. Uh, church at first, how many apps did they have? You know, yeah, they had apples, you know, but you know, they did not have, by and large, written scripture. So when they're doing Bible study, it's going to look a little bit different. We're in here sitting in chairs, and we got a we got a podium, and, and I'm standing up, and you're sitting down, which shows that you get to nap while I blather on, and you know that's how we do Bible study, you know, that sort of thing. Was that an option for them? It might have been an option, but where did most of the early churches meet? People's homes. homes. Does it not change the dynamic when you're sitting around with a meal? And you're talking about, you know, hey, we just heard, you know, tell... Hey, you, you were over in Ephesus the other day and you heard the Apostle Paul speaking. Man, it's, can you tell us what he said, what he was talking about? Okay, let's talk about that. What do we do with that? How do we put that? So, so what do you think we should do with that? that? That's a very different form of Bible study than we tend to be. We think of, we tend to almost go into Joe Friday mode, and this, may, this group may be too young for that even, but we tend to go into just the facts, ma'am, you know. Just, and, and somehow you know Bible study if you can recite all of the judges by name, you know. You know, there's a level of which I want to say, who, who, who cares three dead flies? You know, but the, ours becomes very intellectual. Theirs was very application oriented. As they're sitting around and saying, what do we do with this? Uh, so again, think... Um, you know, I, I love how, you know, 1 Timothy 4.13, one of the things that Paul says, until I arrive, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhorting, to teaching. And I have to think that those things, public reading of Scripture, exhorting, and teaching, that he's not unpacking three different things, but that those things are all connected. We're, we're reading and thinking about what does this mean and how do we respond to it. How do we put it into effect in our lives? Think about uh, synagogue. The synagogue was a way that, that Jewish folks came together, they read from Torah, and they talked about what does that mean. And the early church continued that tradition, and even in as they moved out into the broader Greco-Roman world, I would suggest in the house churches, you know, when it came to be sermon time, I don't think someone stood up and got behind a podium and said, as you notice in Psalm 70, you know, I don't think that's what was going on at all. I think they're talking about the things that they had heard. They're, they're reading, if they have access to, they're reading perhaps from you know, some Old Testament stuff. There's evidence that fairly early on people started uh, putting together um, some, some collections of texts, almost lists of texts that were of a related subject, uh, a catena of, of texts, and, and they talk about them. I think that's clearly what's going on in their, their assemblies. We tend to denigrate that sort of stuff. Uh, in, in fact, I've, I've, I even had a teacher that used to refer to a small group discussion as, as a, the pooling of ignorance. Uh, but here's, here's the reality. The, the, the notion that our goal in Bible study is not to come away with a longer list of facts that we know, but to come away with a deeper commitment, a deeper relationship you know, with each other and with obviously with God. So again, it's like 
if Bible studies, it can become a ritual, a box that we checked, and you all get extra credit for Wednesday. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, you know, you get that. But it serves a bigger purpose. You know, and, and, and hopefully we, we get that. By the way, I give you a whole list there on your, your sheet, if you see, of, of just the, the places where, and these are just representative of, of places where it says in the New Testament that, particularly in the broader Greco-Roman world, Christ followers were meeting in, in homes. And so that, number one, it limits your number, but it also ratchets up that closeness and intimacy. And I think that's significant. Maggie? Well, I appreciate what you're saying. And, and to me, I also think there's a, there's a little bit different purpose for Bible study that we have today that involves people that have a history of Bill Jacob. They, they were livers. That, that for them, we do things that we talk about now that happened in the past, the things that happened last week, or things that happened a few yeah. years ago. Right. It was a very different, in their mind, it was a very different experience. Um, and, and they didn't have the resources we have to do that, yeah. They're talking about it, and they're trying to, to encourage each other based on those things. And I, and I think, for, for me, I mean, it, part of it is a factual thing. I want to know, the, I want to know how this mm-hmm. came about in this history, if I'm going to believe it. Sure. I don't know that these things are credible, and so there has to be facts involved. But then, but then I see what you're saying about it's not just it's going to list facts. But I think right. my perspective is looking back and and reading what they went through without having the benefit of being able to ask questions of mm-hmm. them. And so I have to yeah. figure out how all of that works in, from the Bible and from the elders. And no. No, I, and, and, and that, to be honest, what you're saying, because that's what makes my socks roll up and down. I really enjoy that kind of stuff of just going, okay, c- can I figure out what this really meant, what they're talking about, and all like, you know, the, the historical stuff. But I think we, all I'm trying to say is, I think that's great, and we have a lot more resources for doing that than, than they had. But let's not lose sight of the relational aspect of it, that we want to come away with something more than just, um, you know, I, I think I went through a stage where, you know, I would want to go hear this person because they've got such great insights. I want to get this person's insights or that person's insights. or that. And there was nothing in it about, okay, I, I want to study this so that I walk away with something that's going to make me a better Christ follower. You know, and and I think that we, I just don't want us to lose sight of that. Different people you meet know. God in different ways. Different people some meet people, God in different ways. Yeah. Some people are going to be much more closer to God, much closer, not more closer, much closer to God on a mountainside with their Bible alone. Sure. I w- I'm like you. Intellectually, I'm going to be stimulated and move closer to God and see God. Some people are going to see it in the forest. Some people are going to see it in relationships. Some people are going to see it in, you know, a historical <coughs> perspective where their grandparents and their great grandparents, you know, and it was handled, handed down. Um, you know, what we have in Scripture is relationship. Deuteronomy six: When you walk along the road, teach your children. Talk about last these things. Sunday, yeah. Last Sunday, I'll promise you, I wasn't here, but I'll promise you that Susanna thanked parents for teaching their children at home. Hmm. And all we do is back it up and, and reinforce it here at church. It's not our job to raise up their children in the Lord. It's the parents' job to do that. And that's relationship that does that. Hmm. Every time we gave our children a spanking, what came after that was the discussion of how did God feel about my school. Hmm. So it was, and I'm sure other parents do that too. So. This, this notion that we... Um, any ritual can become just a thing that you do, you know. Um, and and you know, I, I I want us to walk away with that thought that whatever it is we do, are we making it intentionally about deepening 
who we are in relationship with God and in our relationships with each other. And sometimes that might take, you know, a, a, a post, post hoc discussion, just like the, the spankings took a post hoc discussion. Um, here's the deal. I, all the stuff that can get in the way of that for us, flip that script, those things could be great aids to us to do that even more deeply. The fact that we can process more thoughts and opinions. Uh, the fact that we have so much more access to background and ideas and things of that nature, and we have the benefit of what they experienced in the, the church at first. Uh, but let's stand on their shoulders and, and do what that was designed to do. With, hey, we're going we're gonna to take, they got so far in their relationship with God and they're living out the reality of, of the kingdom of God, Let's stand on their shoulders and go farther so that our children can stand on our shoulders and go farther and, 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 and on like that. It, it's not just a matter of, of, of turning everything we do into a box to be checked. That's where I think we miss it sometimes. And it, it becomes so easy to do because then, you know, we feel good. We feel good about checking the box, right? You know, and it, you know, we do that. But our tendency is to get caught up in the mechanics, and I would say in our culturally conditioned mechanics, okay? Uh, and thereby we lose the soul of the ritual. Uh, so just, again, and, and we'll hit this again next week, but just to, let's just make sure we're focusing on the purpose of the things we do, and not just on the getting it done. You know, we get the get her done mentality. You know, we survived another assembly. Or, you know, there was a, a, a guy I knew one time, he would just say, well, we kept it in the road for another Sunday. You know, I, you know. No, I, I think God wants us to go off-road, you know, sometimes. It's not just about keeping it on the road. Let's be moving in his direction. What's that? Keith, Keith comment us out. Mm. And I understand the importance of the church. Mm -hmm. I get that. But the relationship with the Lord will take you where you need to be. Yeah. And so I think we're focusing in sometimes on the, on the wrong thing. Right. Like just getting them in the water. Right. And, and I agree wholeheartedly with what you said. I really do. I appreciate what you said. Cool. I'll take that in as an affirmation. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for being here tonight. Wes, getting any sleep? Trying your best. All right. Glad to hear it. Congrats again. That's it. All right. You guys are free to go. You've checked the box. You can go home. <laughs> you got extra checks. It's Wednesday night. Hey, you had.